The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, this is Amanda Welch welcoming you to this bite-sized bio web seminar. Today's presentation is titled, How to Prepare a Winning Grant Proposal, Part 1, Getting Started, and is being presented by Gail Siegel, a research associate professor at the State University of New York at Buffalo. Gail is a research associate professor. She's a graduate of Rutgers University for her bachelor's and a Albany Medical College for her PhD with postdoctoral training at the University of Rochester. Gail's primary research focus is the study of cancer stem cells and chemo resistance in retinoblastoma. She has authored over 75 manuscripts and has received a Sybil Harrington Research Scholar Award from Research to Prevent Blindness and a Fight for Sight Alumni Achievement Award. Gail is a fellow of the Association for Research in Vision and Ophthalmology and has served as a member of grant study sections, including the National Institutes of Health, Department of Defense, National Science Foundation, and Fight for Sight. As always, we will have a question and answer session after the presentation, so please type any questions that you have into the questions box that appears on the right-hand side of your screen, and I'll put them to Gail at the end. The recording of the webinar will be available at bit.ly slash grant proposal getting started. That's bit.ly slash grant proposal getting started, all one word, lowercase. So now over to you, Gail, for the presentation. Thanks, Amanda. And thank you to Bite Size Bio for sponsoring this webinar on how to prepare a winning grant proposal. This is the first part of getting started. And it's first of a three-part webinar series. Uh, today is the getting started. Next week, we'll cover the nuts and bolts of your research plan. And the final week, we will talk about res responding to critiques. And these are all three are going to be standalone webinars. So if you can't make one or you miss one, it's OK. They're going to be uh, individual. And getting started, let's get started. As the questions occur to you, um, please feel free to write them in the chat box for later discussion, as Amanda mentioned. Um, I'm going to be talking mainly in generalities, and a lot of you have specific questions, so there'll be plenty of time at the end to uh, have a back and forth with some questions. So where do you begin? This is the very beginning. Um, there are a number of things that you can do before you even begin writing the research plan of your proposal that will help you in the long run. And these are some of the topics that we'll cover today. One will be choosing your timing, then developing the idea, targeting your proposal, bringing people on board, and getting approvals. So we'll start with the first part, which will be choosing your timing. When is the right time to submit a proposal? Um, well, first of all, if you're a student or a trainee, it's probably best to meet with your advisor and figure out a suitable timetable based on your coursework and where you are in your project and what other people in the lab are doing um, and that sort of thing to make sure that you're both on the same page. If you're a PI, you need to think about timing in terms of where you are in your project, other responsibilities that you have, whether it's teaching or things going on in your personal life, and any deadlines that are approaching. And you know this can be very important to make sure that you have the time to dedicate and devote to um, working on the grant. A lot of these large funding agencies will have grant review cycles, and then you can plan accordingly. Here's an example for National Institutes of Health. One of their mechanisms has a January 25th, a May 25th, a September 25th deadline throughout the year. So you can plan it according to you know what which dates might be best for you. Um, you know January 25th, you might say, oh, I'm going away for the holidays. I don't have time or what, whatever it is. So you can work your your schedule according to the cycles and the due dates. Some of the smaller agencies may not, but some of the bigger ones do, like National Institutes of Health. And the other thing you need to think about is, in order to send in a, a reasonable grant proposal, you really need to have preliminary results that will indicate that your methods work and that your idea is feasible. And these are very important. I know some of you are thinking, well, you know, this uh, call for proposal says that we don't need preliminary results, 
But in general, it's really much better if you do have something to show, um, even if it's not as much, let's say, as, a, as another type of proposal. If you can show them that you know how to do those methods and that your idea has a chance of working, you're already a step ahead of some of the other applicants. So keep those things in mind as you go forward. And at, at some point, if you decide the timing isn't right, you can wait. I mean, it really is okay to wait uh, to gather some of the information and save it for when the timing is right. Um, in general, it's better to wait than to submit a subpar proposal. And there are some, of course, exceptions to this. Um, you know, you want to pick the timing. Occasionally, the timing picks you. Uh, once in a while, you'll get a one-shot chance at a at a grant, you know, from an agency, and that's the only shot, and you've got to go for it. Um, if your tenure clock is ticking down, and you're you really need to get some funding, sometimes you end up sending out proposals, you know, at a time that's not the best. But if you have a choice make the timing work for you um, if you can. So the next part of um, the discussion is to develop your idea. Um, and this, this is a very important thing to think about and to talk about. So in, in developing a winning idea, you're walking a very fine line between the novel and innovative and the feasible. And when you think about it, in these very challenging times of uh, grant funding, you really need a, a novel, creative, compelling idea that will convince the reviewers that this project must be done. This is really important. We need to do this. Um, but at the same time, if it's so novel and so innovative, you can risk um, the possibility that it's not feasible. So if this is really a constant struggle between getting the most novel idea that is also feasible. And by novel, we mean it's really got to be something unique and interesting. If it's just repeating you know, what another lab has already done or something very incremental, it's probably not going to do as well as something that's really, you know, something that really grabs the attention of the reviewers and really uh, gives them a lot of reason to say this, this project must be done. But always remember that the feasibility is another important part of it. And you need to have testable hypotheses as part of your winning idea. And again, we get back to the idea of that the methodology exists that you plan to use and that you're able to do it. Um, if you're not able to do it, you need to find collaborators or someone who can do it and make sure that that is known um, as you're developing your idea. And so these are very important aspects of developing your winning idea. And another part of this, which um, you don't always think about quite as much, but also important, the facilities, the resources, and the institutional support. Facilities and resources is really um, the nuts and bolts of your uh, institution, university, you know, the, uh, the core facilities, the common equipment, and the things that maybe you don't have yourself but are gonna be very useful in doing what you need to do. And those need to be in place, again, either with you or with your collaborators. And then in terms of the institutional support, by that we mean the actual university. For example, if you're a clinician who also does research, you need to be sure that in addition to clinic time that you have research time and that there's a balance between your clinic or your teaching and the research and the support for the research that you'll be doing. And reviewers also look at this and see whether this, is, this looks like your idea can go forward based on the support you have from your institution. So these are, again, things to remember. Now, um, moving on, I'm gonna talk a lot about how to target the proposal as you're thinking about it. Again, you haven't even written one word yet, but you need to think about, you know, you have an idea, you want to get this idea in front of a pair of eyes that will appreciate it and somebody that will actually uh, be really interested in it and understand what you're doing. So there are several ways that you can target your proposal that will um, 
help you in the long run. So one of my favorite ways of targeting is to look for the funding sources that are listed in the acknowledgement section of articles in your field. You think if those authors received funding, you could too. And of course you can save these articles for your bibliography. So this little cut and paste job that's a little bit out of focus here is from one of the acknowledgement sections from my one of my own articles. And I've underlined in red several of the funding sources. So you can see National Cancer Institute and and the SUNY Brain Network of Excellence, and this Kirk Gessner Foundation, Research to Prevent Blindness, which is a foundation, National Eye Institute, oh, a biotech company, at Roche, uh, NIH, and even an internal uh, grant from the Center for Protein Therapeutics. So this is a gold mine of different funding sources for this one paper. And so I really like doing this, going through, um, you have to do a literature search anyway, so you may as well find, uh, look in the acknowledgement sections, which you don't usually read, and find some of these funding sources there uh, and, you know, look into them further. So you can explore governmental and private funding agencies that are related to your field and see if you qualify for any of their funding mechanisms. And here's an example, this is a summer student fellowship. They tend to be sometimes very specific. This one is the Fight for Sight, um, pursuing eye-related clinical or basic research. Uh, uh, it's unrestricted, it's, there's the dollar amount, uh, two to three months of full-time research. And if you get money from another source, you're generally not eligible. So there's a lot of information right there in that, um, little blurb right there from the website and you can find you can do your targeting that way through through different um, websites and governmental and private agencies and you can think creatively about it for example if you study retinoblastoma as i do you can apply for grants that are that might you might think are peripherally related to such as uh, cancer pediatric cancer ophthalmology genetic diseases or orphan diseases. So don't be stuck only on your little one specific um, little place in, the, uh, in your field. There could be some related fields and related funding agencies that might be interested in your work. So to keep an open mind while you're looking around for this and, and do some targeting if you can. So once you've identified a potential sponsor, make sure to check the deadline. I mean, this seems really uh, common sense, but you definitely want to make sure that you are you have a reasonable amount of time before the deadline, uh, before, you know, so that you have time to actually work on your proposal and do a good job with it. You want to download the instructions and read them carefully. And then you're, it's definitely a good idea to contact the sponsor with any eligibility questions or any questions before you start writing. It's a real shame to go through all the work of preparing this, then finding out, uh oh, you're not eligible, you can't do it. So it's it's really good. The sponsor is usually very happy to let you know, you know, even things about what they're looking for and who would be eligible and all kinds of interesting things you can get from the uh, the sponsor before you do anything else. And again, well, once you've identified the sponsor, you need to read their mission statement. Do they prefer clinical or basic research? Do they want a cure-related proposal? Can you make a case for a cure if it's biomedical research? Um, I mention this because this is a very important uh, aspect of the application. And if they, if the funding agency really only wants clinical trials or they only want something that's cure-related, and your project relates to diagnostics or you know something else, that may not be what they want. So it really pays to spend the time to understand the mission statement. And if you're not sure, again, you can ask the sponsor to clarify. And if possible, um, I also say look at the successful proposals if you can, um, if they're posted by the sponsor. I know the National Institutes of Health does this quite a bit. And it's really helpful to look at, uh, you know, 
not only the formatting and the you know the, the actual grant writing but what you know what are the topics and what what was successful for this particular funding agency and you can you know sort of mold yourself in, in into that format and see you know hopefully you can convince them that you're just as uh eligible and as as competent and uh, you know and it's important to do this project as the ones that they that they uh, sponsored another part of targeting is to identify the study section if applicable and a study section would be the panel where um, these are the people that are going to review your proposal and this is important too because Again, you want to see the people that you want to read your proposal are the people you want to convince and that will understand what you're doing. And so, for example, this is National Institutes of Health, NIH, and there, this is a, a list of some. They have multitudes of study sections, but the, here's, here's a listing. And you can actually go through these, and if you click on them, you can get to a description of uh, what the topics are that they cover in their study section. And you can say, oh, okay, well, I'm interested in the AIDS and related research. Uh, I think that's the closest to what I'm doing. And so if you, if you decide to hone in on that, you can even in your cover letter to the um, agency, ask to be, have your proposal channeled toward that study section. You can say, I would please uh, conclude my proposal in the AIDS and related research study section and many times they will uh, listen to you so it's worth doing it if you can and uh, you know include it and tr try to focus your uh, and target your proposal toward the place where you would have the best chance of success the other thing you can do with your targeting is if you can check the roster of reviewers and again the national institutes of health does this and do some literature searches on any of the unfamiliar names to you um, this is really interesting because um, oftentimes the roster is pretty recent. They, they may not have the most up to date, but you'll see who was on that panel over the last year or two. And, you know, names may be familiar or not. Uh, but by looking at the, doing a literature search, you can see what is that person's pet project? What are their areas of research? What, you know, what do they, what are they interested in? And, you know, you could even, um, you know, mention or cite you know some of their work in your background section for example and they'll be very happy to see that um, but be very wary if you see any of your direct competitors if the uh, any of them have a commercial interest in your area or if they support an opposing hypothesis so these are all kind of flags to uh, be alert if you do see this in a study section you can either find another study section if possible. Um, some people in the cover letter ask, I would not like this person to review my proposal, but I don't know how often that is uh, that can happen. So uh, the safest thing is try to avoid that. If you can, sometimes you can't avoid it and you just hope for the best. And not to worry if there are reviewers from your institution or their recent co-authors because they will have to recuse themselves and not review your proposal. They have to actually leave the room uh, and not review your proposal because they have a conflict of interest. So these are the things to do related to the roster. And at this point, what I'll often do is write the cover letter. Um, it's something very easy to do. If you do a checklist, you can check something off your box right away. And basically the cover letter can be very short. Uh, you just see, you know, you have a letterhead, you have a date, and you just say, attach, please find my application and title, blah, blah, blah. Proposal is being submitted in response to this program announcement. And this is also, and this happened to have a study section already embedded in it, but you can add, I would also like these, you know, X, Y, and Z study section. Thank you for your consideration. Please feel free to contact me and that's it. So you now you've got a cover letter, save it, put it away for when you're getting ready to uh, do the rest of your proposal. So again, you've downloaded the application template. You wanna make sure you have the most updated forms. Again, this sounds very um, self-explanatory, but you'd be surprised. Notice here, this one expired June 30th, 2016. Uh, that's a problem. So, and, and what's interesting is sometimes the, the form 
might be exactly the same, but it's got an expiration date on it and suddenly it's not good anymore. So these are things that you really have to check um, before you start filling out any forms. Uh, and then the other thing I like to do, again, before this is before writing any of the meat of the grant, um, gather information that you need for the forms. For example, this is National Institutes of Health. They ask for an employer identification number, which I have here, this is Buffalo's. And your institution should have a website that's got all these various code numbers that you need for different uh, financial statements and forms and grants. So notice that we had you know, the identity ID number and that's where I got it from online. So you can go through, and again, it's very mindless. So if you're not ready to start you know, digging into the grant and the proposal part of it, you can fill out some of these um, different, you know, different little pieces of information that they ask for that you need for, uh, and just set it aside. So the next part um, of the webinar, I'm going to talk about bringing people on board, because no matter how uh, individualized we are, we always there are always going to be people working with us and helping us, and so there are some very productive ways of bringing people on board. My overall rule of thumb is to request um, as early as possible in the process because you want to be the one in control during those final days before the grant is submitted. You don't want to be sitting there, you know, the day before and you're waiting for somebody to send you something. That, I mean, I don't know. Some people are, you know, thrive on that kind of stress. I can't live that way. So always try to send this out very early and make it as easy as possible for the people that you're um, interacting with. So if you're a trainee, again, you wanna consult with your advisor and the other people in the lab to make sure everyone's on the same page. You know, who is sending out the grant, uh, what topic, you wanna make sure everyone's not sending out the same grant, those kind of things. Um, if you need a letter of reference uh, for your proposal, you need to request those as soon as possible. Now, if you're planning to include other personnel in your grant, you want to work out their details about what is their role on the project. This is important because, you know, are they going to be a co-author? Are they going to, you know, what exactly are they going to do? Um, and if needed, and I'll talk about that with the asterisk below, you're going to ask them for, again, the signed letter of collaboration on letterhead that you can attach to your proposal. I mention on letterhead because now in the digital age, sometimes people try to forge uh, letters, which is not good, but you know, you want to make it as legitimate looking as you can and uh, with the letterhead. And as far as the roles now, I'll talk a little bit about the roles that some of these people will play. So you've got a co-principal investigator, and that is actually a co-equal with the principal investigator. Sometimes there's a one and a two, sometimes they're equal. But that, for this person, you definitely need a letter of collaboration, and um, they usually get a salary of some kind um, on your budget. Same uh, salary also for the co-investigator. They also need a letter of uh, reference. Co-investigator is more like a collaborator, so they're, they don't have as large of a role as the co-PI, but you know it's a collaborator. Probably they would be a, a co-author on the paper with you. And then you have consultants, and they have a much, usually have a more limited role. Um, and again, those people do need a letter of reference to say what they'll be doing. And they occasionally will get paid maybe um, on a per job basis or something like that. Sometimes they're unpaid um, occasionally. Then you've got people that may provide technical support, lab technicians, administrative support, um, and trainees. A lot of times you don't need letters of uh, collaboration from these people, but you know you do want to be able to define the role and see what they're going to do, and you want to get all that straightened out um, way ahead of time. So the best thing you can do for these people that need to write a letter is you write the letter for them, because they're doing you a favor, they don't have a lot of time, you know what you want in this letter. So write the letter for them. Here's an example of one that I, dear, put your name in there. I am pleased to continue our productive collaboration as co-investigator for your project entitled the Double Horn Mutation in Unicorn.
horns being submitted to the Mythical Creatures Foundation. So there, uh, in the first sentence, you can see continuing our productive collaboration. They've worked with you before. Put that front and center. You know, we, we have a great time working together. As you know, our group maintains the largest unicorn colony in the world with a repository of fixed tissue for your study. So this is important. They have exactly what you need for the study. That's got to be in the letter. Our joint publication on the mutation demonstrates success of our collaboration and our continued commitment to the shared goal of improving unicorn health. So again, working together, success, put these positive words in the letter. I have all the necessary resources and equipment and expertise and enthusiasm to carry out my role as co-investigator I look forward to continuing our exciting and innovative collaboration with great potential to advance the field of unicorn husbandry. So it's not a long letter, but it includes everything in, as far as what they're going to be doing and how well you guys work together. And that's the sort of letter that you want. So write this letter for them. All they have to do now is uh, sign it and uh, send it back to you on their letterhead and you've got what you need. In addition to the letters of support, while you're at it, you've got them uh, by email, um, ask them for their biosketch in the correct format. And if they send it to you in the wrong format, correct it yourself. Uh, don't try to send it back to them and back and forth. Uh, it's easier just, you know, they're doing you a favor, try to, to uh, fix it yourself. If they have any methods that you need for your proposal, See if they can either, either send you a, a reprint or methods from their lab, you know, that you can include with a reference uh, back to them uh, that you can include in the proposal. And you'll also need their other support, which is other funding they have. And with that, uh, you may not need it right away. You might get it later. But as long, I, I, sometimes I ask for everything because as long as you have the one email chain, you may as well put in, you know, these are the things we need, A, B, and C. The other people that you need to bring on board um, are the people in your grant office. Uh, if your grant office can help you draft the budget, they'll review the proposal before it's submitted, they'll make sure it complies with the rules, and you want to get them on board very early uh, because they're, you know, you're all on the same team. They want the your institution to get funding, you want funding, so work together as a team to uh, generate funding for you and for the university. You'll stay on their good side if you send them and, and get in touch with them and let, let them know you're sending the grant out and tell them way in advance because if you wait until the day or two before, they won't have time to do everything they want to do. And there are some places that have gotten so uh, strict that they won't even help you send it out if you get it in, you know, an hour before it's due. So you really, you want to get them on board very early and they will help you a lot uh, in, in terms of preparing the proposal. Uh, the next part um, that I'm going to cover, again, we haven't even touched the research plan in this, uh, so far in this webinar, is you want to get approvals and uh, um, get some of the boilerplate things uh, ready. So if your project requires human subjects, animals, or common to DNA, or biohazards, you're going to need to submit internal approval forms to your university at an early stage. And at the very least, these should be listed as pending approval on your proposal. Even better, uh, if you submit them early enough, they get them, they'll get they be approved entirely. And sometimes, there, you know, there can be hassles with trying to get um, the grant submitted if you haven't even sent in uh, a request to have this uh, work approved. So it's good to get them in and you can even say it's it's pending which is fine. Um, sometimes they don't even, until the grant is funded then they'll want, for sure they're going to want before they even start the project to know that it's been completely approved. So there are these boilerplates that um, I like to do ahead of time too. Everyone's got a different order of doing things. These are the sections of your grant that can be used grant to grant. Some, most of the time they just need minor updates, but if this is your first time doing it, it's good to you know make these things and then uh, go back to them and update them as you need to. So your resources page. That resources section will give you a chance to describe your institution in glowing terms including all the capabilities that allow you to carry out the project. 
So if you look in this shaded area, the resources, you, you always want a sentence like this right at the top line of your resources. The scientific environment described below will greatly contribute to the probability of success for this project. All necessary institutional support, equipment, and other physical resources are available to the PI for the successful completion of this project. So you put that in right at the top, front and center, and then you go on to describe your spaces, your lab, your office, your animal facility, your clinical facility, your computers, and any other resources such as the core facilities that you will use for the project. And so you need to do it in sufficient detail that they can see that you have what you need to do the project that you're describing. The equipment section sounds simplistic, but again, it's a list of your equipment and shared equipment that will allow you to carry out the project. So again, you wanna give enough detail for the reviewers to understand the capabilities. So this again is from my own grant in the shaded area. And again, first sentence, the PI has all equipment necessary to complete the aims of this project. You stick that in there, you know, the reviewer um, will see that first and say, oh yeah, I guess, I guess they do. Um, and then you go on to list your equipment and, you know, here's my microscopy. So you talk about, you know, sort of the brand name and the model number of the microscope and what it has and, uh, you know, some of these sort of things. And you go on and, and talk about the different pieces of equipment. Um, and again, you know, as you add new equipment to your lab, you can update this, but for the most part, um, it stays a lot the same. Same with the resources. They stay a lot the same unless there's something new going on. You can also do your personnel justification. So this is where you talk about the people that are going to be working on the project and why they should be working on the project. So you mention their name, what their degrees, what their role is, and their experience. This one's for me. I stuck this one in here, so that would be me. You put in, I'm principal investigator. I have 17% effort. That's the amount of time, you know, that I'm gonna dedicate to the project. Explain, you know, my field, ocular cell biologist, and some of the work that I've done, 25 years of experience, over 70 publications, and then go on and just write a very strong um, paragraph about the person, and you wanna do, do this for the collaborators, for the co-PI, for the technicians, and for the students that you, that you can name, you know, if you, have, you already have them on board. And you can, and then you put your, their role at the end, responsible for experimental design, data analysis, and publication of results. So that's basically what you put in a personnel justification for the, and it's, it's used, it's linked to the budget, so they can see this person is doing the amount of work you would expect for 17% effort, or whatever it ends up being. You have a chance to write a statement for your biosketch. This is National Institutes of Health, but a lot of other institutes have a biosketch statement where you can talk about your history and why you are qualified to lead the project, and you can adjust it to fit the project. So here's my statement. I won't read the whole thing, but um, you talk about the goal of the research. You talk about the long and productive history. Um, I also mention uh, my postdoctoral advisor died, so I had I overcame adversity to develop my own research program, and then talk about the cell line, developing a cell line, and um, you know talk about having the scientific expertise, the work ethic, and the leadership skills to direct the project to a successful conclusion. And you can, this middle part, you can adjust based on what the topic is for um, the grant. So if it's, you know, you're working on a little bit of a different subject or a little topic that's different, you can focus on other parts of your work. So this can vary according to uh, the grant that you're sending out. You also want to get together your other support, and this means the other funding that you have um, to do your work. So you describe your current and previous support if they request it, and sometimes they ask for dollar amounts and effort. And again, here's an example from one of my own grants. One of my, um, I was a co-PI on this grant. Purpose, um, you write the agency, the purpose, the dates. And the reason they ask you to do this is to make sure that there's little or no budgetary or scientific overlap with the proposal you're writing now. Um, if there is some overlap, then you need to own it and explain that you'll adjust the budget if you need it. Like say, you know, aim one of this project is the same as the aim one 
of the project I'm writing now, then I can say, okay, we'll adjust the budget accordingly and you know, make, make it so that you're not double dipping is pretty much what they're worried about uh, when they want you to talk about the other support. So in summary so far, um, you wanna choose your timing and not have it choose you. You want to develop an innovative yet feasible idea. You wanna target a suitable sponsor you want to bring people on board early, get your approvals and prepare the boilerplates. And of course, the next installment of this will be actually writing the research plan. And if you have any questions or comments, I left a lot of time for discussion because I know, I, you know I'm talking in the general and you may have specific questions. So I'm going to leave the slide up and we will open it up to more discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Gail. That was a great presentation. We have a few questions from the audience. Thank you. So if anyone else has a question, please feel free to post it in the questions box that appears on the right-hand side of your screen. So the first question that I have is how early, you were saying that you should bring people on board early to avoid the last minute rush or deadline for things. How early would you recommend people bringing someone on board before the um, deadline? Um, it really depends because some deadlines, some of the NIH, you know, some of the proposals are massive, you know, 50 page mm -hmm. ones and some are two or three pages. So they take different amounts of time to actually do. Um, so if it's a big grant, like some sort of big massive NIH grant, you probably want to, you know, talk to them three or four months ahead of time because there could be a chance maybe you want to run an experiment together or, you know, just show that, especially mm -hmm. if you have no, have had no contact with that person, um, develop a relationship with them and maybe do a couple of experiments together to show that you ha can have a track record. Um, so that if it's something that's smaller, you could probably don't have to wait that long, but I would say, you know, three or four months before. Okay. Um, and we have a question from Jordan. They want to know if you wouldn't mind going back to the boilerplate slide. Okay, let's see if I can get there. Back to the boilerplate. Okay. This? I believe so. Okay, yes, yeah, that's so, the line that they were talking about. Yeah, so that's the boilerplate section. And, you know, sometimes you can just make a checklist. Sometimes I like to have a checklist and check things off. Um, and these are things that you can do a lot of it without even you know, having worked on your uh, research plan part of it, but you know, you have a lot of this in your head as far as what you have, what you need and start working on that. I usually like to do all that stuff ahead and then you, then you can focus on the um, research plan strategy. That's a good idea. And then we have a question from Adina and they're asking, how can you prepare for your first grant proposal before you actually have a specific grant in mind? How can I prepare for the fund? Um, as far as getting an idea, um, read the literature, I guess, would be the best advice mm -hmm. is read the literature and see what's out there. And a lot of times at the end of a publication, they'll say, oh, future uh, studies should uh, examine this, this, this. So they'll, they'll even lay it out for you. Of course, sometimes they're planning to do it themselves, but sometimes you can read between the lines and see what, what should be done next in this mm -hmm. field and uh, get it from there, get it from the, from the literature. Okay, and along those same lines, Stephanie asks, um, what are the best ways to develop the idea or ideas without stepping on other people's toes or overlapping too much with other people's work? Um, yeah, you have to sort of create your own niche um, if there are ways to do that. It's okay to reach out to some of these people that you admire or that you're, you know, you're reading. Maybe you want to collaborate with them. Um, a lot of times people are very happy to collaborate and um, I've, that's what I found, at least in my experience, and uh, talk to them, and they, they may have ideas, too, because, you know, you know, it's better to be a collaborator than a competitor. That's always my philosophy. I think that's a good philosophy. And also, you know, you build upon everything together. And that's yeah. More efficient. Um, okay, we have a question from Lorena, or Lorena, um, and they say, thank you that, for a great informative seminar. But most of the presentation was centered around established PI researchers, et cetera, 
they want to know if you can comment on the first grant proposal. Like if this is your first one. Right. So um, as far as, well, I've talked about the trainees needing to talk to their PIs. If you're an early PI um, in writing your first grant, these are all the things that you need to do as far as uh, looking at um, looking at the literature, seeing what's out there, looking at other grant proposals. I mean, a lot of it involves uh, seeing what's out there and modeling it yourself. Sort of, you know, that's kind of the best way to, to go out about doing the first one. Now, you can ask for a colleague's advice if you've never written one before and you have some trusted colleagues that, you know, you want to sit down with them and, and go over some of these things. A lot of times mm -hmm. people can be very helpful that way. And then they're following up on about targeting personnel, how much research, um, I guess they're, oh, how much, um, so how much research, so preliminary results should be in proposal? I know that's like the, uh, the $64,000 question, you know, <laughs> you, it's, <laughs> and that's why I mean, I was so general because you, 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 you really need to show, like I say, that you, your methods work. You have to show examples of all the methods that you're going to use in your proposal and that your idea is feasible. And it's not like I can say eight figures worth or three figures, you know, it's really going to vary from one proposal to the other, but you've got to be able to look at it and not, you know, look at it critically and say, oh, they don't, they can't tell that I know how to do a Western blot, you know, or you've got to put something in there that even though you've done it, you know, 50,000 times, they don't know. So you need to show them that you can do it, even if it seems really, you know, I published on this before, but it make it make it very easy for the reviewers to see that you know how to do all of these things. And then kind of following up on that, because I know that sometimes you include co-investigators if you don't have um, specific expertise in that area. Um, Hashem asks, who should they include as a co-investigator? Um, so if you, again, starting early, and let's say you've got a great idea, but your lab is not set up to do stem cell culture or something like that. Find, you know, a lab, find labs that do the stem cell culture and then, you know, see me talk to the meetings or contact them and say, hey, I've got this really neat idea. It involves stem cells, but I, you know, I don't know how to grow them. Would you be interested in collaborating? So find, you know, people that have published and have a track record. And it will, you know, it look great on your proposal to show, oh, I've got this real expert on stem cells. It's going to help me uh, grow them for this project. And then they're going to send me the cell lysates. And then we're going to run the experiment over here on this. So, um, yeah, find the established people if you can. Um, you can also get people from your own institution, um, work together with them. Sometimes that's a good idea because they're, they're nearby and you can meet them on a regular basis. So either way. Okay, and then Ankin asks, how much freedom do you have in changing the research plan once you get the grant? There's a fair amount of um, flexibility. You know, you're not stuck on uh, everything that you've written because a lot of times you start doing something, as we know, you start with plan A and then something completely unexpected happens and it takes you down a different route. Mm -hmm. So you're really not uh, stuck into one little Cubby hole. You can, you can, um, there's a lot of flexibility. I mean, you want to make sure it's related, you know, and that it's, it makes right. sense and that there's a thread of continuity, but there's a fair amount of freedom. So if you find something that's in, like, if you get an unexpected result that's interesting, you can feel, you can go down that path rather than having to stick exactly to what you've proposed. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, and then Anna asks, um, how often do you submit a grant proposing to perform a certain number of experiments that you've already done but not published? I'm assuming they mean something where you have, you know, a lot of preliminary data on one aim or two aims or something like that, not that you've already done it all and now you're submitting the grant. But it's unpu you're saying it's unpublished? Unpublished. Um, you're, you're free to put unpublished results in your grant. I mean, the, the reviewers are sworn to confidentiality. So that information is not supposed to get out anywhere. You know, you hear about the bad eggs somewhere mm -hmm. that once in a while they, but really um, you can put unpublished data in there. And then, you know, you can say if you're, let's say you're starting to write it, you can say manuscript in preparation or something okay. like that. Um, even if you've only written a few pages of it, it's in 
in preparation. So uh, it sort of lets them know that you're working on it. Yeah, right. You're not lying. It's in preparation. And uh, then it kind of makes, makes people stay away from it. And then they think, oh, she's got it. So we don't have to, you know, do that. And then, so yeah, definitely include it, unpublished results um, in the proposal. Okay, and then, um, oh, this is an interesting one. So Alu, Alu Watosin, um, sorry if I mispronounced your name, which I probably did. Um, what is your opinion about writing a proposal with your PhD mentor as someone who just finished their PhD? Um, usually um, as you're finishing your PhD, um, and you're moving into a postdoc, so you would tend to do things related to the postdoc's lab mm -hmm. in general. Um, and even especially moving from postdoc to a faculty position or a PI position, they tend to want you to move away from your training. You know, as you leave right. one area of training, move into the next. Um, that's a, And it becomes more and more true, especially if you're a PI, you want to kind of, you know, develop your own niche and not still be considered uh, the trainee of the person where, you know, that you've left. So if you can, you want to try to, you know, carve out your own little niche there. So if you were writing a proposal, say, like, after you finished your PhD or maybe when you're um, close to finishing up your postdoc, is it appropriate to include maybe something in your bio sketch about how you're differentiating yourself from your mentor? Oh yeah, you could definitely do that um, and say, you know, a great opportunity and now my lab is, is doing this. And yeah, you can definitely want to because yeah, otherwise they, you know, the reviewers sometimes might think, oh, this person is just a clone of their advisor and they're not doing anything different. So it always is a good idea to show how you're different and distinct from what your advisor was doing. Okay. And then, um, oh, Hashem has a follow-up question on the co-investigator and they said that, we often hear that including a famous investigator, a famous investigator on a grant helps. What do you think about that? Um, famous, um, you know, I, I would say established is probably good. It doesn't have to be the person that won the Nobel Prize, you know, for that method. Or as long as it's somebody that is you know, has a good reputation, has mm -hmm. publications. They're going to be seen as uh, as a positive, and so especially someone who that you can work together with them, you know, and be a good collaborator. Um, you know, sometimes the extremely famous people are so busy that they're they're just not going to have the time. Um, so yeah, there's a there's sort of a, a trade off between extremely famous and just known in the field and well, well enough, you know, established that they can definitely help you and uh, you know be helpful to your project. Yeah, it makes sense. They, you want them to be helpful, not just not just a pretty face. Right, right. Um, and then we have a question from Ranjitha. Um, and I, I'm guessing that their question is going to be different based on this. But um, is it necessary to have preliminary data for a new PI or trainee? And I'm guessing that the answer would be different based on whether you're a new PI or a new trainee. And they go on to ask if that if it's necessary to have or if it's just good to have and will that make any difference in the decision making process um anytime you can have the preliminary results even if you're you're new um it it helps a lot um mm -hmm. so i you know sometimes you just can't i mean if you're you you know if you're an extremely early stage trainee then you're not going to have a lot um, and people take that into account you know if you're like national science foundation mm -hmm. some of those some of those um applications that people put in, they don't really ask for a lot of preliminary results. Um, and, and in that case, you know, people will understand, okay, this person is uh, undergrad going into graduate school and they don't even know where they're going yet. You know, so there, there is some slack there okay. if you don't have it at a, at a very early stage. Later on though, if you're a postdoc or a graduate student or even a um, PI, you definitely want to see if you can get preliminary results to show. And then following up on that, Ankin asks, how do you write a successful grant for setting up a new lab when you don't have any preliminary data results in the project? Um, well, a lot of times if you're setting up a new lab, your institution will give you startup funds as far as, you know, setting things up like that. Usually if somebody is coming in mm -hmm. with a, a faculty position, um, if you don't have preliminary results and you don't have a lab, you might be able to get, you know, 
go into a colleague's lab and say, look, can I uh, borrow a bench in here and run mm -hmm. some experiments here in here? Um, people are, you know, really nice. If someone asked me, I'd, I'd let them come in and do a few things. So I guess, I mean, the thing is, if you can, it's probably a good idea to do it um, because it will help you. That's, it will help you a lot to have just something, anything, even one thing on there to show that you're getting things up and running. Otherwise, the reviewer might think, oh, they, they haven't been able to do anything or they may, it may, it may cause, raise more red flags. Okay. Um, would it be like, let's say, you know, there's always some lag between the time you're hired, at least generally for a, P, a PI position, between the time you're hired and the time you actually start. So if you have say a couple of months where you're finishing up your postdoc and you have say preliminary results for your new line of research as an independent investigator, is it possible to bring that into the grant or is that frowned upon? Yeah, I mean, if that's considered your research and of course you would wanna to talk to the advisor and make sure mm -hmm. that it's all okay. But yeah, I mean, that would be fine if it's you know your work. I mean, that happened to me when I went from, uh, it started my first tenure track position I had to wait about two or three months for them to paint the lab, so I didn't, <laughs> I, didn't <laughs> I didn't, I didn't have a lab to work in. Um, so I spent some time writing grants based on some work I had done before. Um, so I did spend the time doing that. But yeah, or or not even. I think I even asked somebody like, "Can I grab a few? You know, use borrow your microscope and look at some of my slides?" Or because everything was packed in boxes and. Yeah, it can be a challenging time, mm -hmm. um, but it can also be a good time to write because you can't do much anything else if your lab's not up and running it. But the thing is, you do want to have just something, anything that you can show is something, oh, yeah, I know how to do this. Yeah, that makes sense because you've got to prove to the reviewers that you can do this. Um, and then we have a question from Claire, and I'm going um, to I'm gonna say her specific question, but I think it could be easily generalizable to everybody in the audience. Um, she's asking if you know if there are any funding sources accessible to engineers or at the master's level. And I think it could be just generalized to, do you know of any good resources to where people could search for grants? Aside, I know that you mentioned looking in the acknowledgement section of papers that are published, but are there any good search engines or anything like that? Well, you know, a lot, most of our institutions have a sponsored programs website and they will list uh, funding sources too. I didn't even mention that, but yeah, you're, look at your institution's website and go to uh, their grant office website or sponsored program, whatever they call it. And they usually have a list of funding agencies. Um, your professional societies will also have a mm -hmm. list of funding agencies. That's a good idea. And thought about the professional societies, but yeah, they're, they want you to get funded as well. Yeah. And then we have another question from um, Olu Watson, Watus, Watusen. Um, so they are asking about kind of, they were asking about the differentiation between your PhD mentor after you graduated or after you're done. Um, and this is a follow up on that. And they said, what about cases when you are working on environmental studies and you're moving to another environment, but you need the expertise and equipment of your PhD mentor? Will that moving away be enough on its own or is it better just to stay away from your PhD mentor in general when writing a grant? Um, I guess that's a gray area. I mean, if the, you require, if you require the equipment that you needed for your PhD, um, you know, I mean, I guess that could be somewhat of an exception to the mm -hmm. rule. Um, ideally you'd want to get the equipment yourself or apply to, you know, put that in your budget and say, I need this equipment because I'm leaving my, you know, my advisor's lab and I want to set this up for myself now, or, you know, so right. th that's kind of how you could approach it. Okay. And then um, I've got two kind of related questions, one from Nitin and one from Medina. Um, the first is how feasible is it to get funded when you're an early career or a brand new PhD student applying in a different but related area and maybe you don't have preliminary data in that sub in that particular field. So like if you were just graduated with your PhD and then you're switching fields almost entirely in your postdoc. Um, it can be challenging, but it can mm -hmm. also be seen as an opportunity. I know I've reviewed some grants like that where somebody was switching entirely and you can make a case uh, for, you know, why you're making the switch and what you bring from your uh, one early training into this training 
you can make a case. You can probably uh, do a good job convincing, you know, why you're making the switch mm -hmm. and show, you know, this is some of this. Th these are some of the things I did before. And now, um, you know, I'm moving into this area and these are some of the things we hope to do. I mean, like there is more leeway given to trainees and earlier stage people than, let's say, a, a PI. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then kind of in that idea of getting a PI, it's a good segue. Adina asks, what is a reasonable goal to set for the amount of time between getting your PI position and, and getting your first successful grant? Well, it's one of those things where you can make a plan and then it, you know, you, I mean, you really don't have a lot of control over that. I mean, the, the mm -hmm. funding situation is tough right now. Um, you, you're going to, you know, you know, for the most part, you're going to usually have to send in multiple uh, applications and revisions and that sort of thing. So you can't really even put a time on it. Um, I mean, you would hope that within the first few years you would get something. I mean, it depends on the institution of how patient they're going to be with you as far as, you know, how much time are they going to give you before they start, you know, getting on your case about why don't you have any funding. Um, so yeah, it's hard to just say an exact time. Uh, you just do your best. You put things out there. My mom always says you got to hit the puck to the net like hockey, you know, mm -hmm. so you, gotta, you send things out and do your best and hope that it comes through. But you can't really put a timing. It's like saying, I want to get married by the time I'm 30. I mean, that doesn't always <laughs> didn't happen for me. <laughs> so it doesn't always happen the way that you exactly want. Mm -hmm. um, but hopefully it works out. You just do, do your best and I hope that it comes in in the first few years. Yep. That's what my, um, that's what my dad always said was, you know, number of shots on goal. That's yeah. When, that's how you get it. Yep. And then we have a question from kind of continuing that idea of switching fields. Um, Ankin asks, uh, suppose you want to change your research direction where you don't have much expertise. Is it always necessary to get a collaborator who has their expertise that you mentioned to increase the probability of getting the grant? That would be ideal, really, mm -hmm. to show that you're going to learn with this person or you're going to work with this person or they have the expertise. I would re really recommend it if you can. And then, um, oh, this one's uh, hard. Um, so Lorena asks, how should one deal with ideas getting borrowed from your grant proposal? And I'm hoping this isn't borrowed by the study section because that would, by somebody on the study section, that would be awful. I know that would be off. It does happen mm -hmm. rarely. Um, it's very hard to prove. Um, but I mean, this is the system we have. I think it's very rare. I mm -hmm. mean, I'd like, I'm a sort of a Pollyanna. I think most people are basically good <laughs> <laughs> and not evil, but um, I think it has happened, you know, once or twice that I've seen in the many years. Um, but you've got to put it out there because if you hide it, then nobody's going to see it and they won't know. So the best thing to do is, you know, put it out there, but also with the plan that you're going to publish it. So, you know, once you publish it, they can't steal it. So, you know, put it in the grant, but then have the plan that, okay, this is going to be published really soon if it's not published yet. That makes sense to me. And um, there's a, usually, even if you do get scooped, there's usually a spin that you can put on it. But hopefully nobody does that from a grant proposal. Because that would yeah. be. Yeah. And then... Um, you were talking about studying or targeting a particular study section um, and you showed the list of names. Is there a way where you can get a better, is there a description of those study sections or does you just have to go based on the name alone? Yes. No, you, um, I'm going to find that slide. Ah, here it is. Yeah. So um, uh, there, uh, this is the NIH website. Um, they have a list of gazillions of these. If you click on, this isn't clickable here, but if you click on the individual um, study section, it will give you a description of exactly, you know, the topics that they uh, review. So, okay. and there are some that are only slightly different. You know, there's some that are so similar that they're just very tiny differences between them. You can re really target specifically. Okay. Yeah, because I was thinking that um, that might be a little bit, when I was reading the question, I was thinking that might be kind of good to know, because I know that there's some that are, seem very similar just even looking off of your list. Um, and then 
I think this is the last question that we have time for. This is from Ankin, and they're asking, can you use the similar uh, similar research proposal for applying to two different agencies simultaneously? Yeah. So I think they're talking about if you submit to two different agencies with the same proposal or a similar research proposal, can you do that? Uh, breaking up a little bit with this it has to do with different agencies simultaneously grant. Yeah. Um, you very upfront about it. Mm -hmm. it has to know that you sent to the one because if much the same you have to read and you know you have to turn on if you get the, the one one down you can't keep both okay that makes sense well I think that brings us to the end of the webinar thank you again Gail for a great presentation and a wonderful I'm not discussion. hearing it now. okay there you go. okay so thank you Gail for a great presentation and a fantastic discussion. And thank you to you, the audience, for taking the time to attend and listen in. If you've enjoyed the seminar and would like to view the video recording of the session, please visit the webinars page in bitesizebio.com. It should be available within the next 24 hours. There, you can also see the webinars we've lined up for you on Bite Size Bio. So until next time, good luck in your research and goodbye from all of us at Bite Size Bio.